Hello, citizens of Earth, and welcome aboard Station 204. Very glad to have you here for this special edition of Tomorrow News. Ryan will be talking some pops from SpaceX, but most of what today is going to be is me telling you all about that detection of phosphine in Venus's atmosphere that you may have heard about two weeks ago. And it's amazing. It's so exciting. I can't wait to share all of the details with you about this. And of course, we want to remind you before we officially get started that if you like what we do here at Tomorrow, such as news or these deep dives, consider subscribing to us, liking our videos, commenting below, sharing the videos everywhere that you can, setting up notifications. Every little bit helps us out here at Tomorrow. So let's go ahead and get this special edition of Tomorrow News started. Ryan, what's popping? Apart from GPS-3 SV-04 launching next Tuesday, the news recently have just been Starship, 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 Starship... I can't continue, that's a tongue twister. Well, that sort of was a half realized. NASA has actually announced that SpaceX will be launching their Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, or IMAP, mission, which will be studying the outer solar system to see how solar wind from our star could collide with solar winds from other stars. This is scheduled for 2024, however, so I'll drop back in then and give you all an update. After SN7.1 failed to pop the other day, just because it was so robust, the Boca Chica team tested it again with higher pressures to really test the 304L steel alloy to its limits. Luckily, it did become a glorified fountain and sprayed Boca Chica with liquid nitrogen. And for some more Starship goodness, SN8 has had its flaps attached, meaning that it is nearly ready for the very big hop, well more like a jump than a hop, up to 15 kilometers. These flaps have been tested, or should I say half flapped, to make sure that they will work when that big hunk of steel will be hurtling towards Earth, which will be lifted into the sky when going orbital by Super Heavy, which has had some parts spotted in Boca Chica. I mean, hey, it's, it's just a steel cylinder at the moment, but I am confident that it will prove to be more than that in just a few months' time. And because schedules have shuffled a little bit since news yesterday, here's an update to all of your Earth departures. Now I want to go ahead and jump to the inner solar system and talk about a specific planet that sort of gets treated like the red-headed stepchild. You know, not really going to end up talking about it too much. We don't really want to investigate it too much. Sorry, all of you redheads and Josh. And of course, I'm talking about Venus. Venus is a very unpleasant place, to say the least, and that may be where the neglect of exploration comes from. But a paper that was put out two weeks ago has an absolutely startling result. It's not something that is just going to make scientists super excited. It's something that could end up completely changing multiple disciplines of science, in addition to challenging how we look at ourselves in the universe. Venus has been known since antiquity. It's the third brightest object in the sky after the moon and the sun. Numerous gods and goddesses were assigned to it throughout history, and several Mesoamerican cultures used Venus for precise timekeeping. Thought of as a star, it wasn't until the observations of Galileo Galilei seeing Venus go through phases that it was realized Venus was actually another planet. And whoo boy, did that get Galileo into trouble, amongst other things. Thick clouds obscured the observation of Venus's surface. So in the 19th century, speculation went wild as to what could have been there. It was thought of that it would be some kind of tropical paradise with oceans of petroleum or carbonated water, which sounds absolutely ridiculous compared to what we know about Venus today. But back then, it was perfectly reasonable to think about Venus that way. Radio telescopes in the 1960s finally began to strike down a lot of those fantastical ideas. Finding that Venus was rotating extremely slowly clockwise, retrograde to all the other planets in our solar system, and that the surface was absolutely not a welcome tropical hideaway, that the temperatures were well above 400 degrees Celsius. Naturally, most people at that point would probably say, you know what, there's a lot of, like, death that can occur in this place, so hard pass, I'm just gonna skip out on Venus. But scientists, nope, they pressed on. But they realized that they were going to need to actually go there. So they got off of their sofas in their laboratories in mom's basements and actually made it happen. 
While the space race was heating up in orbit around Earth, probes from our planet crossed the silent sea to learn as much as we could about a world where visitation would be a suicide mission. Mariner 2 from the United States made the first flyby in 1962, 35,000 kilometers above the cloud tops. This became the first spacecraft to encounter another planet. And it showed that, yes, indeed, the atmosphere is there and it's obscuring the surface and that the temperatures are scorching hot. The Soviet Union sent several spacecraft, but all of them died at some point en route to Venus. It wasn't until Venera 3 in 1966 that they finally had some success. And of course, that depends on how you measure success as well. And that's because Venera 3, about two weeks before it entered into Venus's atmosphere, stopped communicating. It died. Now, it was on course to actually enter into Venus's atmosphere, so a lot of folks cite Venera 3 as the first thing that we ever dropped onto a planetary body in our solar system. But there's actually been some evidence that's come up in the past two decades of opening up those archives of the Soviet Union that may put that into question, but we'll get to that at a later time. However, Venera 4 absolutely did make it to Venus and conducted the first successful direct measurements of a planetary atmosphere. It was found to contain about 95% carbon dioxide and the atmosphere was thick enough that standing on the surface would subject you to an equivalent pressure of being 3,000 feet underwater. Paradise had become hell. In 1969, Venera 5 and 6 were able to enter into Venus's atmosphere and successfully confirm Venera 4's findings, but they did not make it to the surface. It would take until late 1970 with the Venera 7 mission that we would finally have our first spacecraft confirmed to land on another planetary body. Now, Venera 7 was able to see that, yes, indeed, it actually is 460 degrees Celsius on the surface of Venus, and it lasted about 23 minutes in that absolute awful environment. When the United States decided to go all in on Viking and Voyager, the Soviet Union stayed the course and kept Venus in the crosshairs with the orbiter lander duos of Venera 9 and Venera 10 in 1975. Both successfully landed and Venera 9 became the first spacecraft to return an image from the surface of another planet. And that's not tropical, unless you consider basaltic rocks to be festive and carefree somehow. In addition, it was found that Venus's clouds had multiple layers to them, not just a thick haze. 1978 rolled around and NASA was finally ready to enter into the Venus game. And they sent two probes in order to do that, the Pioneer Venus Multiprobe and the Pioneer Venus Orbiter. The Pioneer Venus multiprobe carried four atmospheric probes, which sampled a multitude of data points. None were designed to survive the descent through the atmosphere, but as luck would have it, one probe did, and it transmitted data for 45 minutes in the searing, crushing heat. The Pioneer Venus orbiter carried 17 instruments to expand the knowledge base, ranging from the surface, the atmosphere, and Venus's extremely weak magnetic field. It eventually ran out of fuel and was destroyed via atmospheric re-entry after 14 years in orbit in 1992. Also in 1978, the Soviets were back in the mix with Venera 11 and 12. But unfortunately, all of the upgrades that they provided to the landers, such as color cameras, a robotic drill arm, and soil sample analysis, systems didn't end up working. But during the descent through the atmosphere, they were able to detect that the clouds had quite a lot of chlorine and sulfur in them. So Venus is really starting to sound like an absolutely terrible, awful, no good planet to try and go visit. So of course, we continued to chuck masses of exotic metals with circuitry at Venus. Venera 13 and 14 came in 1982, with Venera 13 providing the first color images of the surface of Venus. Light from the sun decidedly stained a harsh, sickly shade of yellow. Now both landers carried microphones and recorded audio to measure wind speeds. And this actually allows us to hear the sounds of another planet's surface for the first time. Everybody, let's take a listen. Sounds pretty peaceful, huh? It actually might even be relaxing to be there if it weren't for the dying bit. Through photos, a surface compression instrument, and other systems to analyze the surface's makeup, Venus is primarily basaltic rock. 
And Venera 13 holds the record for the longest operation of a lander on the surface of Venus, 123 minutes. The Soviet Union kept the missions on a roll with Venera 15 and 16, which were going to be observing the surface of Venus. But how the heck do you observe the surface through those very thick, obscuring layers of clouds? Well, it's actually relatively easy radar specifically a type known as synthetic aperture radar. Any radar system can be used to scan an object and make an image of it, but synthetic aperture radar does this on a moving platform, like, say, a spacecraft in orbit, and it accounts for this motion, pinpointing data to match exact locations over multiple scans from different angles, which increases the resolution of the radar image over time. Venera 15 and 16 were only able to provide coverage of the highest third of Venus's northern latitudes, but the resolution the radar provided was around one to two kilometers per pixel, somewhat better than what could be achieved with radar from Earth. And that was more than enough to show that Venus didn't appear to have any active plate tectonics. But there were topographical structures similar to shield volcanoes here on Earth. This provided the first real detailed understanding of the surface geology of Venus, and it may very well have discovered volcanism on Venus as well. In late 1985, two Vega spacecraft on their way to Halley's Comet zipped past Venus in order to use it for a little gravitational assisting. And as they did, they dropped off two landers and two atmospheric balloons. During descent into the atmosphere, the landers returned data which showed that the clouds were made of droplets of sulfuric acid, now confirming that Venus will corrode you on the way to the surface, crush you when you reach there, and then set your leftovers ablaze. The balloons were whipped about in Venus's atmosphere at nearly 300 kilometers an hour and discovered more atmospheric motion like convection and general turbulence than expected. This was the final Soviet mission to Venus and Russia has yet to send one back. For the United States, the two pioneer Venus missions were the final interplanetary missions for nearly an entire decade, from 1978 until 1989, which that drought was ended by a mission called Magellan, which has an absolutely amazing origin. In the 1980s, planetary scientists in the United States were clamoring to get a mission to Venus, specifically with synthetic aperture radar. And in 1983, they got their mission, the Venus Radar Mapper. After the titanic costs of the Viking and Voyager programs, Venus Radar Mapper needed to be made on the cheap. So NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory did what they do best. They made it happen. They sniffed around their facilities and they grabbed a flight spare of Voyager's bus to make up the main body. They also grabbed a flight spare of Voyager's high gain antenna, Mariner 9's medium gain antenna, and the flight spare computing guts of Galileo. Keeping in line with the low cost priority of the mission, the synthetic aperture radar was the only instrument Magellan would carry. Magellan was in a sense a true Frankenstein's probe, and when all set and finally ready to head off to Venus, unfortunately the Space Shuttle Challenger accident occurred. This ended the chances of being able to use a high energy upper stage to deploy Magellan and get it to Venus rather quickly. Having to switch over to a less powerful inertial upper stage, which uses two solid motors, Magellan's journey to Venus was now extended from the original six months to 15 months. In May of 1989, Space Shuttle Atlantis on STS-30 deployed Magellan and its inertial upper stage. They moved away, and with a proper firing, Magellan was on its way. It arrived at Venus in August of 1990, and Magellan began a mapping campaign with its lone radar instrument that was expected to map over 70% of Venus's surface at about one kilometer resolution. But over the course of its nearly four and a half year mission, it would document 98% of Venus's surface at a resolution of just about 100 meters. Not only did Magellan exceed its expectations and objectives in every single category it was asked to, it ended up testing a new technique that no spacecraft had ever done outside of orbiting around the Earth, aerobraking. With an extended mission in 1993, hoping to map the gravity field of Venus in higher precision and wanting to use as little propellant as possible to enter into the needed low circular orbit around Venus, engineers at JPL did what they do best, they made it happen. They programmed Magellan to dip ever so slightly into the atmosphere of Venus to gently slow itself, and it worked. 
Finally, in October 1994, with solar panels beginning to lose the ability to generate a sufficient amount of power, Magellan's thrusters were fired one final time, and on October 13th, its final orbit was taken. Although the majority of Magellan probably vaporized on entry, there is likely wreckage of it laying strewn about somewhere on that blazing rocky surface. It would be a little over another decade before we sent our next mission to Venus, and that would be the European Space Agency's Venus Express, which was there to study Venus's climate and atmosphere over long-term observations. Entering orbit in April 2006, it began an eight-year mission that found a massive double vortex in the atmosphere at the southern Venusian pole, the confirmation that Venus has lightning, but it occurs at a lower activity level than lightning here on Earth, that a layer of ozone actually exists in the upper atmosphere, and there's a cold layer in the atmosphere where carbon dioxide may precipitate, almost like a snow of dry ice. And one of the bigger findings, strong evidence that Venus had water just like Earth. As a bonus, much of the data gathered by Venus Express was used to further refine climactic models that enhanced our understanding of the anthropogenic global warming we're currently causing here on Earth. During ESA's Venus Express mission, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency was going to send its own mission that would look at the atmosphere and surface of Venus in a multitude of wavelengths that would complement Venus Express. That mission was called Akatsuki, and little did anyone know just how difficult it was going to be. Expected to enter orbit in December 2010, the orbit insertion burn did not go for as long as planned, with Akatsuki going into safe mode and continuing outbound into a heliocentric orbit. Careful engineering tests of the spacecraft diagnosed the problem. The throat of the combustion chamber of its orbital maneuver engine had been destroyed. But Jackson didn't consider Akatsuki as dead as a Venera after an hour. No, they looked at the reaction control system, saw how much hydrazine they had left, and determined that they could use that to enter into orbit. But it would require waiting till December of 2015 to try again. So Jackson made their decision, yes. We'll allow Akatsuki to stay in a heliocentric orbit for five years, and then when it arrives at Venus, we'll let you try the reaction control system thrusters. And lo and behold, the day came, and JAXA nailed it. Originally going to be placed in a 30-hour orbit, the teams now had to settle for a very highly elliptical orbit that took nine days to complete. But Akatsuki has been taking a wealth of imagery and data for scientists back here on Earth to study, finding a jet stream in the lower and middle cloud layers, developing some of the first 3D maps of the atmospheric structure of Venus, and finding that the middle layer of clouds may have water droplets present. Akatsuki continues to operate in orbit around Venus today, so excellent job on that mission. Thought lost, but saved by its reaction control system. Wow, man, JAXA is just really good at that stuff. So now you know a total history of the direct exploration that we have done of Venus. So what has that got to do with this study that came out about Venus with the phosphine in the atmosphere? Well, it turns out in nearly six decades of exploring Venus, we missed a very important discovery. The study that did this all began as a thought experiment. How would an extraterrestrial civilization end up detecting life on Earth? What would be those telltale signatures? One conclusion was phosphine, a colorless, flammable, explosive gas, a molecule that consists of one phosphorus atom bonded with three hydrogen atoms. Phosphine is very easy to detect in microwave K-band wavelengths. It's also gas that's been found on Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, and now Venus. At Jupiter and Saturn, it's a product of naturally occurring reactions in the deeper layers of the gas giant's atmospheres where hydrogen reigns supreme. Here on Earth, it's a byproduct of life. But at Venus, there is no solid explanation for the presence of phosphine presently. The reason this study is attracting so much validity and excitement is the fact that the teams and the telescopes that were used are all world class. This is not some yokels who just sent out a shot in the dark paper that appeared in some journal that started last week so that it could gobble up your subscription revenue. No, these are the all-stars of science doing incredible work.
Led by a group from MIT headed up by Professor Jane S. Greaves from Cardiff University, it also included multiple universities from the UK and Japan with experts in astrophysics, biology, chemistry, planetary geology, and atmospheric sciences in the mix. That's a hell of a team. Computer modeling of Venus's atmosphere was done in order to see if you actually could have phosphine there, and they found that, yes, you can. It would be in the mid-latitudes of Venus's atmosphere, but it would be scarce if nearly non-existent near the equator and the poles. So you've got a solid data set that says, yes, this should be a thing. So the team got cracking and wrote a proposal that this surefire bet would get them telescope time. But that didn't make this easy for them. The James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii, which is a sub-millimeter microwave telescope, outright rejected that proposal for observation time. But the collective group threw a challenge to that ruling, and the rejection was itself rejected, and telescope time was allotted. A lot of things have to go right for you to have productive telescope time. You have to have good weather, right atmospheric conditions, good instruments, and a working data collection system. So for five days in 2017, that team was lucky enough to have everything that could go right, go right. Looking over the data, they found the phosphine exactly where it was modeled to be right in those mid-latitudes of Venus's atmosphere. Now the team needed something a bit more potent to grab the data from. So they submitted a proposal for the incredibly powerful Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. It was approved and the observation was done in March of 2019. The data gathered from ALMA agreed with the data taken two years earlier on the JCMT, once again lining up with the models. So the group did exactly what you do when your data and models all agree with each other. You go into it and you viciously rip it apart looking for false positives. In doing so, they found that there was none of that in their data or their models. Everything really was in agreement. All of a sudden, this team had a monumental discovery on their hands. Now the gear shifted to trying to find a process outside of life that could generate phosphine naturally in the concentrations that the data shows exists in Venus's atmosphere. Months of work analyzing and modifying models couldn't account for it. Natural processes would either not work at all or produce phosphine at levels up to eight orders of magnitude less than what presently exists. The group's conclusive explanation is very simply stated, there isn't one. The paper is very clear that if a chemical process can't explain the levels of phosphine present, then it has to be a process that may not have been considered possible or something that we don't even presently know about. But there were three candidates, geochemistry, the interaction of rocks, photochemistry, the effect of light on materials, or possibly a byproduct of life. And that is the absolute stunner. The study had to recognize that through all of its methods and all of its tests, that there was the possibility that this excess gas in Venus's atmosphere could actually be from a biological source. And having a paper with the data to back that up, actually admitting that is something that is completely unprecedented. But of course, the authors of the paper are very right to caution everyone that this is not a discovery of life. This is just a discovery of a signature of the possibility of life. And it's very, very important to remember that because Venus's atmosphere, we really don't know much about it. So that long bout of history that we started with in this segment is the foundation to the realization that the total amount of time scientific instrumentation has sat studying Venus's atmosphere in situ on every single mission combined is shorter than a single flight from Singapore to New York here on Earth. The geochemical and or photochemical processes that happen on Venus could be radically different from what we have here on Earth. 
If it does turn out to be a geochemical and or photochemical process, then that ends up challenging some of the fundamental cores of theories in geology and atmospheric sciences. We could also look at phosphine and say, well, you know, if it can occur geologically and or photochemically, maybe we shouldn't use this gas to try to hunt for life when we're able to analyze exoplanet atmospheres. All of that in and of itself is pretty exciting, but the possibility of it maybe being life in the atmosphere of Venus, that is the cherry on top of a super paper Sunday. Now there are good reasons for why life is on the table, because there are things that we do know about Venus's atmosphere that we can compare to conditions that life on Earth can handle. Certain layers in Venus's atmosphere at the mid-latitudes, where the phosphine was found, are conducive to allowing phosphates that would be present to be reduced into phosphine, which is done biologically. In addition, we know that the circulation of the mid-latitude atmosphere of Venus is a cycle that lasts about two to three months, which is more than enough time for microbes here on Earth to go through a cycle of reproduction. The MIT group is now moving to gather more data for their studies, so that way they can diligently continue to work to try to prove themselves wrong about it potentially being life. And I'm sure independent groups over the next year or two are also gonna grab this study and try to do that as well, because that is how science works. But something that's very, very important, you can only do so much at home, right? Over the course of 72 hours, the focus on a mission to Venus went from, well, it requires a niche of engineering that's currently beyond us to allow exploration, so we're just gonna have to wait a few decades to flagship class mission right now, make it happen. It just so happens that NASA, Roscosmos, ESA, and several others actually already have their sights set. NASA currently has four mission proposals competing for its upcoming selection of two missions in the mid-range discovery program. Two of those four mission proposals are Venus missions. Veritas, standing for Venus Emissivity, Radio Science, INSAR, Topography, and Spectroscopy, is an orbiter that would spend three years generating a surface map via synthetic aperture radar with a resolution of up to 15 meters, along with an infrared spectrometer that can look through the clouds at surface makeup. The other mission is Da Vinci, standing for Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry, and Imaging. It would plunge into Venus's atmosphere, sampling at all altitudes to get a better understanding of the evolution and current atmospheric interaction, along with imaging the whole descent, providing data to ascertain the geology of the landing site. Both NASA proposals would launch in 2026. Roscosmos has Venera D, a dual orbiter lander mission in the early concept phase. A collaboration with NASA is expected, and it could include an ambitious lander designed to last up to 90 days on the surface, and an aerobot that would fly for up to four months in the upper atmosphere. The Indian Space Research Organization has done preliminary studies on an orbiter with an atmospheric balloon probe. Called Shukrayaan 1, ISRO has received a multitude of instrument proposals from universities in India, along with NASA, Roscosmos, and France's National Center for Space Studies. The European Space Agency has its own solo effort called Envision, currently as a proposal finalist in the upcoming medium-class Cosmic Visions program mission selection. Proposed to spend four years in orbit, it would use a synthetic aperture radar provided by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for high-resolution surface mapping. It would also have a separate radar to analyze the subsurface and a suite of spectroscopy instruments to study surface composition, temperatures, and atmospheric measurements. Peter Beck, a good friend of Tomorrow and the CEO of Rocket Lab, earlier this year said that they would be sending their own mission to Venus to drop off an atmospheric probe during a flyby to hunt for potential life. Now it seems that we should be asking Peter to buy the lottery tickets. Rocket Lab was already collaborating with the MIT team that made the phosphine discovery, and with the recently operational Photon spacecraft bus, the plan is to have an atmospheric sampler that operates for as long as it can, with a stated desire to send a campaign of missions to Venus. As per his tweet to me, 2023 is looking to be the best time to head to Venus. So Rocket Lab may very well beat out all of the planet's space agencies to getting back to Venus and potentially confirming that life is or isn't present. You know how people think that Elon is a Martian? Well, maybe Peter is a Venusian. I mean, I, I don't know. 
It's not just Rocket Lab who seems to have had a momentary burst of clairvoyance. Back in 2018, the European Space Agency and JAXA ended up launching a dual probe together called Bepi Colombo. It's heading off to Mercury where it's going to arrive in orbit in 2025. Now, on its way, it's actually doing two gravitational assists at the planet Venus. And they had already scheduled scientific observation during those gravitational assists. And they have an instrument on board that may possibly be able to detect that fossil. The first flyby is on October 15th of this year, and next will be in August of next year. ESA spacecraft has a thermal infrared spectrometer aboard, and that has the best chance of catching phosphine to become an independent verification. But don't hold your breath. It's unknown by that instrument's team if it's actually sensitive enough to catch the phosphine in the levels that are present. Another thing to keep in mind, this first flyby is at roughly 10,000 kilometers above the cloud tops. That is quite a distance. And the announcement of the discovery of phosphine has come too late to change the current observation plans to better aid in the hunt. The flyby in August of next year occurs at a much lower altitude, a mere 550 kilometers above the cloud tops. So if the detection were to occur, the chances would be much better for next year's flyby. There's a lot on the books for both current and potential missions to Venus, but what would an ultimate top-of-the-line flagship class mission look like? Well, turns out, six weeks ago, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center actually dropped a study about a flagship mission to Venus and exactly what it should look like. Flagship class missions are multi-billion dollar all-in-ones, designed from the ground up to find answers to as many of the big questions as possible, and as well, generate new big questions no one had ever thought of. The Venus flagship mission study includes an orbiter, two small sats, an aerobot, and a lander. Total mass, nearly 10 tons, with an estimated budget at approximately $3.7 billion. Now, because of that nearly 10 ton mass, the launcher would be a Falcon Heavy in a fully expended configuration. There will be no reuse there. The launch would occur in June of 2031, with the two small sats deployed immediately, allowing them to fly independently of the primary spacecraft. Now, the main spacecraft would perform a flyby of Venus in October of 2031. The two small sats would actually arrive at Venus before the main spacecraft sometime in August of 2034. And even though there is a flyby performed in 2031, the main spacecraft will not enter orbit around Venus until November 2034 to allow for the mass of the aerobot and lander to be carried on a single mission. The aerobot is released five days before orbit insertion and once deployed will last a minimum of 60 days in the atmosphere. In orbit, the main spacecraft deploys a synthetic aperture radar and begins surface imaging, finding an appropriate area for the lander, which is released in May 2035. It takes about an hour to descend through the atmosphere, and it then begins seven hours of surface operations and will carry a weather station that will try to operate for up to 60 days. The mission of the main spacecraft continues until it performs aerobraking in May of 2037 to lower into its final polar science orbit, which it will reach in May of 2039. Composition of the surface of Venus will be studied from orbit and on the lander, as would atmospheric makeup and motion, magnetic field interaction, solar interaction, imaging systems in optical wavelengths and others that can penetrate Venus's thick clouds, and because of the recent study, I'm pretty sure they would also throw something on there to hunt for life. The designs are in place, so the only thing stopping a Venus flagship mission is approval and budget. Had you asked last week, you could have included motivation as something also holding back a Venus flagship mission. But with that recent study, there's no longer an excuse for us to not go to Venus. So hopefully that was a thorough enough examination of the exploration of Venus, what we discovered, and what we're going to be doing, hopefully, in the future. And if that was simply not enough for you, we're going to go ahead and drop links to both the paper from the Royal Astronomical Society and that awesome Venus flagship study down in our description below. So make sure to take a look at that. Let's go ahead and wrap up by saying thank you to all of you who helped contribute to make the shows of tomorrow possible. 
Today was one hell of a deep dive, and these kinds of videos and shows that we make simply just aren't possible without your support. The time, the effort, and the resources are difficult to acquire on our own. It takes a concerted effort amongst our team to make it happen, to have the equipment to make it possible, and to have the time to make sure we have our shows at the quality that we feel the universe needs to be shared at. So if you'd like to help support us at Tomorrow, consider heading on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join and take a gander at the levels and rewards that you can get. And don't forget subscribing to our channel and setting up notifications, liking our videos, commenting below, and sharing our videos with everyone that you know is another way that you can be an incredible help to us here at Tomorrow. Woo! And that is Seco 7 for this week's edition of Tomorrow News. Thank you so much for watching. And until the next one, remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep exploring. Venus's climate and atmosphere in a long term <laughs> in the atmosphere where carbon dioxide may per the sphere where carbon dioxide may per wow I can't say precipitate I just said it now but I can't say it then mission would be sent to Venus and that would be the European ex the European expresses Venus space administration I'm where am I during Venus's ESA, ex, do, man, I keep getting those mixed up. If we come back to Earth, though, <laughs> if we come back to Earth, wow. Veritas, standing for Venus Emissive Geoscience Insar Topo, Topography, Radio Science Insar Topo, Topo, Stupid these backronyms!